It's a neat, neat part of the world, isn't it? The trails here, the, the, the river. We're very happy that Gary shared it with us. We're using this as an introduction to La Fontaine number six. One of the last three videos that Gary scripted with us just prior to his death in January. We really miss him, but he'll be with us for a long time. His synergy, his ideas, and his thoughts. They're gonna be in today's video. We'll have Heather with Gary off camera speaking that we on, on footage we captured in Missoula last year. Paul and Char Stimson, myself, and my lovely wife Gretchen. Welcome to number six and enjoy. Hello, I'm Heather LaFontaine Ellison and my father Gary LaFontaine is with me and he'll be speaking off camera while I tie the deer hair hornet. Which is one of my favorite patterns, one of my favorite terrestrial patterns. Um, you know, we did a number of studies when we wrote Fly Fishing the Mountain Lakes and we studied how uh, land insects end up on the water. And one thing we did, uh, the second most important way they ended up on the water was um, uh, we simply put a pan of water out in the backyard and what we called in um, accidental um, uh, landings. Uh, they weren't blown in. Um, they just happened to uh, land on the water. And um, we, 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 went and we looked at the pan of water in the morning and we, we, we looked at all the different types of insects, insects that were in that pan of water. And um, you'd be am amazed at the number of bees that simply end up in the water, bees and hornets. And uh, now that's what the deer hair hornet, hornet looks like. And Heather is gonna put on five alternating bands of uh, deer hair, yellow and black, black and yellow. Now I'm going to, this is going to take a little bit more working with than really soft uh, spinning hair. This is some coarser hair. So I'm just going to keep on seesawing my way back. Now the way to really work with this kind of hair is to pack it. And that's important is packing it, isn't it, Heather? Heather? Yes, it's, it's going to take out the gaps. When you trim it, you would be able to see the gaps. Otherwise, this is going to make it nice and, and nice and thick. So that's our first band. Just in case, we're going to go ahead and put a little half knot in here in case we break the thread in between working with these bands of hair. Now we're going to put in a yellow one. I've put a base on the hook of, of thread winding it forward and then back at kind of an angle. That just helps give a, a base that's a little bit more solid. Heather, by the way, was taught to spin deer hair and handle deer hair by a, by a master. She's um, uh, much better at it than I was. Uh, we were at a conclave one year and she was about uh, 13 years old and um, uh, standing next to me and uh, while I was tying flies and the person tying flies next to me was Dave Whitlock and uh, um, Heather happened to come up and was standing next to me and Heather had been tying flies since she was four but um, uh, Dave sat her down and uh, spent a couple hours showing Heather everything there was about deer hair. So, what I loved about deer hair was the all of the different colors. I could tie in purples and greens and all sorts of different colors. And and that's another thing about this pattern is the the colors are neat. They're vibrant. And since we're using black thread, it's really important to pack in that that yellow nice and tight so you don't see the black threads through it. And with five packs, these have to be really, really skinny little uh, uh, sections here. Going to throw in a little knot again. And that's just a little half itch. Real skinny little section. Doesn't take much deer here to make those sections. My father happens to be cursed with breaking his thread on spinning deer hair, so I'm just making sure his curse doesn't, right, doesn't right. spread over to me 
And I take a little insurance policy and make a knot in there in case I break my thread spinning this there. And now the third pack. Now again, this is kind of really coarse hair, so just really let it spin as you seesaw through it. You anchor it in the pack right behind it that's already nice and secure. And what we found in testing this fly was we weren't looking for a realistic um, fly. We were looking for that alternating black and yellow um, uh, coloration. Yeah. We're getting a little bit close to the hook. The end of the hook, we'll just keep pressing it back. It doesn't packing hurt it, to be nice and tight back there. Packing it tighter and tighter. I'm just going to put a small little pack of yellow here. Get all of the of that under fur out of there, the fuzz that tends to be in deer hair because that makes it very hard to spin. One great time to fish bee imitations is after a rainstorm. Uh, you'll get those late late rains in the fall. Those afternoon rainstorms, uh, they tend to wash in a lot of bees, and uh, that's that that seems to be when trout will tend to lose their caution of being stung. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and tie in a little wing of antron. I'm going to go ahead and clip it. I'm going to pull this from a patch and just pull out a good section of it and clip it off there. You'll end up with about this much. Now I'm going to set that aside because this is going to be hard to tie in the, the wing unless I have this major part of the fly clip. So I'll go ahead and tie off my thread here. And then do a quick quick clip. You'll start to really see that hornet coloring and take shape as in, in that hornet shape. We do get a little bit of fancy with this trim job on this. Go ahead and rotate the vise around. Okay, you can always trim that up, make it all pretty later on, but this just gets the majority of the hair out of the way. A little bit more underneath close in there, babe, because you're going to have to have a hard time. There you go. Trim that out because you have a hard time working with that afterwards. There you go. You can give me a haircut anytime you want. <laughs> I'll give you a mohawk. There you go. Just what I need. in that it's it's a little longer a little long wing there oh and of course you can't do that without thread <laughs> right thread helps <laughs> either, either that or instant in, in, uh, uh, super glue yeah go ahead just Pinch that right in there. Nothing fancy. Okay. 
clip off the tips. Make that a nice, nice flat wing. Now I'm going to go ahead and make the head nice and clean now because I'm going to be putting another little patch of black. One more patch. Just a tiny one. And just for contrast, a little bit more thicker, a little bit more bulbous than the black. Then the, then the last, the back black will be a little bit more bulbous than the last yellow patch. Now this gets a little bit tricky because this black is a little bit hard to work with, but we want it to spin around the entire front here. Okay, now pull them back. Secure them down with a nice thick head. And again, you don't need to be gentle with deer hair. You can push it right back there. Jam it back. Okay, now, like he said, I'm going to go ahead and make that a nice rounded. And you trim that head without trimming your wing, and you got a finished fly. Which is about the only trick to the fly, is just getting this cleanly clipped. Super fly, especially after a rainstorm. On, a, on, a, on an afternoon, on those late afternoon rainstorms you get in, 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 in late summer. Don't stand out there in the, in, in, in the thunder. Find safety, find shelter. But then after the rainstorm ends, go back out there and fish the deer hair hornet. And you could find yourself catching fish after fish, trout after trout. The deer hor hair hornet. Okay. Very effective. Sometimes in the springtime when the water's muddy, you need to add a little flash to your fly. I've, I used flashback pheasant tails and flashback hare's ears for years and, until I started tying with Gary LaFontaine's Clear Antron. This stuff reflects an awful lot of light and actually is easier to tie with than any other flashback material I've used. So let me tie a hare's ear with some Antron, Clear Antron flashback. I'll start my thread in the middle of the hook shank so as to remember which part is abdomen, which part's thorax. And I'm going to tie on a tail of brown henback. This is a henback feather and I like to just pull them out to the side to even up the tips and I'll just strip that off for my tail. I'll tie in this tail about one half to three quarters the length of the hook shank. Okay, after trimming off the excess there, I'm going to tie in a ribbing of gold wire. I'll tie that ribbing on the far shank or the far side of the hook. And now I'll apply a little dubbing. I'll take some hair's ear. and dub this right on to the thread. I want to keep the abdomen fairly thin. And I'll wrap that up to about the halfway Okay, I'm going to take a little bit more dubbing now 
and make it a little bit thicker and go into the thorax just a bit to provide a base to tie on the wing case. I want my thorax to be just a bit thicker than the abdomen. Okay, then I'll pull my rib through. Provide segmentation as well as a little bit of flash. And I'll tie that off. Okay, for the wing case on this fly, I'm going to use some clear Antron. I'll just pull some fibers out. Trim the tips so they're nice and even and tie it down right at the halfway point and I'll leave it there and pull it over after I've dubbed the thorax. Okay, with a little bit more dubbing here. I want to build up the thorax so it's wider in diameter than the abdomen and leave myself some space to tie off the fly at the front. Okay, after the thorax is dubbed, I'll pull the Antron wing case over and tie it down right behind the eye. After trimming off the excess, I'll wrap that down and whip finish. And that completes the clear Antron flashback hairs here. Thank you and good night. Gary used to fish at the Clark Fork in Missoula when he was going to the, uh, school in Missoula, going to college, and um, that made him think of the snow stonefly. That's the next fly we're going to be tying. Lots of times in the winter, um, that's about the only food that's available in the Rocky Mountain streams for the fish uh, is the stone, uh, snow stonefly. The um, midges sometimes don't even get up and move around, and even if they do, um, we have noted that the fish will prefer the larger stonefly. So we'll start that um, now with, uh, normally we're, we would be tying this in about a mm, 16 to a 20 in that range. But today, as you can see, I've got a larger hook and I'll be tying it in a size 10 so that you can see it either. And we'll start out with um, a, a different way of making tail. We have some um, duck quills and we're going to make our tail out of that. So let's get started. I'm going to begin this fly with a base wrap of brown thread. Since the body of the fly is brown, notice I use the tension of the tag in to help me set each subsequent uh, wind next to the other one. You get a real nice smooth body that way. The first thing we do is to get our two uh, uh, quills from opposite side, duck quills, and take a piece off of each one here to form our wing. And when, what we want to do is make these opposing so the curves go against each other. Okay. Get them all lined up. And I'm going to tie them in here so it's about a uh, hook gap long. It's all the longer we want these to be. Get them tight down and sitting just the way we want here. There we go. And tighten it up a little. It's not going to move around on us. And we've got our tail and those just divide real nicely. You can make this one a little cleaner looking there. Okay. Trim off the excess. 
The next thing we do is use some BT's dubbing wax here to get some wax on our thread. What we're going to do is use seal X, which is a synthetic seal uh, dubbing. And we're going to make a little um, egg sac right here at the back. And this egg sac should be thicker than the body, bigger around than the body. So we'll just get a nice bunch of this on here and wrap it right there at the beginning of the fly. I think we could use just a little more than that, maybe. I want a nice round egg sac here. Okay, now I'm going to trim off some of this wild stuff. Although we don't have to get rid of it all. Okay, now the next part of this fly will be uh, the brown dubbed body. And the only way you judge how long this body should be is just to leave enough for your wing and your hackle. And for this, we're going to use some um, Rocky Mountain Dubbing Brown Muskrat. Uh, the recipe calls for mink, but you can substitute this if you don't have any mink. And this will be more slender than the egg sac. Just get a nice body here, leaving enough space now to put on our wing. And this wing is made out of black calf. If you take a look at a calf tail, lots of times down here at the end there'll be a little bit of black. Now we're not going to stack this or anything. We just want to take a chunk of this out, trim it. Now the wing will never be on Gary's flies, they'll never go beyond the bend much. So we want to put it just right in here like this. Tie it in. And now we'll remove the excess. Okay. This is a bi-visible wing, or I mean a hackle that we're going to be putting on. We're going to put on one hackle of black. And then we're going to put on some white hackle in the front. And that really makes it stand out and easy to see. So we'll start with the black first. Let's trim off the excess here. Take several turns of the black. That one turned on me a little. Doesn't want to go on the way I want him to. So we'll start over here a bit. Let that hackle know who the boss is. There we go. There, that's better. Okay, get rid of the end there. Now we're going to take some white hackle. This saddle hackle I'm using today, and this this white one actually came off of a ginger saddle, but lots of times if you look you'll find some real nice white hackle in there with the ginger. So always kind of save that. And lots of times it's a larger size, and sometimes finding a size 10 hackle you want to use is not the easiest thing. But of course you'll be tying this in a lot smaller size. And now see how that stands out when you tie those two different colors of hackle in there. And this is our snow stonefly. And you need to take this out cold February day when even the midges are hunkered down. And you'll see these stonefly out there um, skittering around on the edges in the ice and falling into the water, etc. And the fish really go after them. It's a nice meal that time of year. There we go. Okay, for this next fly, I'm going to tie the improved foam inchworm. Now, the only improvement on this fly is um, the addition of an edgewater foam cylinder and white antron yarn over the eye. Uh, let me read you a paragraph that uh, Gary told us about this fly. Inchworms live in trees. When they get ready to leave the nest 
they lower themselves on a silken line. Unfortunately for them, and fortunately for trout, there are plenty of trees hanging over streams. They will lower themselves onto the water. And if they're not gobbled up while they are dangling and skittering on the surface, the silk line will break and they will drift along on top of the water. That's when you need a pattern like the foam inchworm. Gary said he stood downstream from specific trees loaded with inchworms and the trout were just waiting for the naturals to break free. They were really fussy about the imitation. So let's tie this fly. Okay, I'm going to start by tying a thread base on the hook. Back to the barb. I'm going to leave a tag there because I want to segment this body when I'm finished here. Okay, I've already prepared an, a uh, Edgewater foam cylinder, punched a hole in it. I'm going to slide it onto the hook, just part way, and I'm going to take some super glue. Put on the top and underneath. Slide the cylinder back, just even with the barb. And then I'm going to tie it down in the rear, bring it forward, tie it down in front. Okay, now for time's sake, I've already prepared a piece of packing foam. I colored it with a Pantone pen, let it dry, colored it again, and then coated it with Aquaflex. And you can see how shiny that makes it. I've cut myself a strip, pointing it at the end to make it easier to tie in. I'm going to tie that in. Bring my thread forward, and I'm going to wrap this for the body. You don't want to pull too hard because this stuff is still, it will still snap if you pull on it too hard. Make two or three wraps, and tie that off, and trim off the excess. Okay, now I'm going to take my tag that I left and make some wraps to segment that body. You can see how that's starting to begin to look just like one of those inchworms. Tie that off in front. And now I'm going to take a piece of white Antron yarn, tie it in the front. And this is basically here for visibility for the fisherman. You want to pull that back and tie it off in the front so it helps to elevate it a little. Trim off the excess. And you want to make you want to trim this just the same length as the eye. Now you normally would tie these on a uh, size 16 standard hook. I'll go ahead and whip finish this, half hitch. And there you have it, the improved foam inchworm. On this pattern, the rollover mysis shrimp, it's another one of those patterns that Gary developed that falls into the category of action with action, if that means anything to you. And what I'm referring to is if you move the fly, 
it not only moves forward in the water, but it flips over. And when you pause, it flips back the other way. And that's because we counterweight with a piece of lead. Now we've used the, this particular fly on the Taylor's Fork of the Gunnison in Colorado. Some huge fish there, and it's one of the few flies that will consistently take them. And you have to have the fish looking at the fly and see it roll over. Best when, when it's pausing and sinking, and then just one light tug on your fly line will make it flip back into the upright position and then back in the upside down position. And we're going to have to uh, form some monofilament eyes, and I'm going to do that first um, because they got to cool off, otherwise you end up burning your fingers with the darn thing. So we're going to melt those monofilament eyes first out of this material right here. And I will tell you a little story about this material. I was at a, at a trade show in Denver doing some demonstration fly tying, and I had to walk my dog Dub and give him a, a, a break. And we were walking down the railroad track, next, next tracks next to this convention center, and we found this piece of junk laying along the tracks that looked like it came off the back of a semi that keeps mud from flying all over the place. Well, I ended up picking that thing up and bringing it home, and it makes the absolute best monofilament eyes you'll ever see. But we'll go ahead and get into that here in a moment. We're going to start by placing the monofilament, a, a cut piece, into our uh, sure grip tweezers. The easiest way to burn monofilament eyes and get them consistent is to not try to do it all at once. Here, we'll start with a flame. And you notice what I'm doing is taking the flame away and putting it back. It gives you a nice, even melt on your eyes. You see, those eyes will, will work, look really good on this fly, but for right now, we need to set this aside, and when you lay this down, lay the uh, unit down like that, not like that, because you, you'll end up taking those melted eyes and, and flattening them in the wrong direction. But I'll just set that aside for a minute. Set aside my lighter, and let's go ahead and put on a thread base. And we're going to start back from the... Uh, from the eye of the hook just a little bit because we need to leave some space up there for the head and the eyes. And we're just going to wrap back. Whoops, I think I better stop do this over because I need to make my, need an extra long piece of thread. So pull out extra tag end because you don't cut that tag end off. It becomes a rib material. Let's just wrap back to the bend. That's about where we want our tail tied in and then we'll come back forward. We need to start by putting um, some lead wire on the top of that hook shank so that it'll f cause that fly to flip over. And we'll do that right there like this. Now before I get back where I, to where I want this to stop, I'll trim it off a little bit ahead of time so that I can then wrap on back and bind down that piece of lead. You see how that just kind of falls in line? Now the other thing you want to do is to take some Aquaflex and your bodkin and just spread it along there Set that aside and let it dry. But for, for time's uh, considerations, we're going to just go ahead and tie the fly without doing that. But for your own, for the durability and keeping that lead up on top, you'll want to put a little shot of Aquaflex on it. Now we're going to just use a plain ordinary hackle feather for the tail. Let me just toss this aside and put my vise back where it was. And, uh, and we'll just even up those fibers and pull the feather away from the fibers and that way they always stay lined up real nice. And we don't want this tail much longer than probably the gap of the hook. And we'll just bind it into position. And I'm going to just uh, wrap over that whole lead application just to kind of build up some of the body out of the uh, remaining tail fibers. We'll just trim those and get rid of them. And let's uh, wrap our head thread to the back here now. Now things get a little bit more difficult at this point because we're going to be cutting marabou off of the stem and making kind of a marabou dubbing and putting it into a dubbing loop. And we're going to use a tool that we sell. It uh, makes it a lot easier. It's a rotating tool. We'll start first by getting some BT Super Dubbing Wax and we're going to wax one side of that dubbing loop. I'll just put the cap back on that, otherwise I'm going to have feathers and everything stuck to that sticky old stuff. And we're going to catch the dubbing loop tool on that thread and form the loop. 
just kind of flip up and over so we can kind of bind that loop into place and advance our thread forward and leave it there. Now we have this loop back here. We're just going to hold that with the, with the tool and in preparing to do this, we've learned a couple of things. You need a fuzzy kind of a piece of marabou, not any of that long stringy stuff because it's a lot easier to get that fuzzy stuff into the dubbing loop. So let me uh, pull this up. We'll just hold the feather and trim a piece away from the stem. Don't let go of it. Stick it right into the dubbing loop. Okay. Now let's get, a, get that feather again and grab a hold of those fibers and cut them away from the stem. Slip that into the dubbing loop. Let's do that one more time. Only I'll flip that feather around and get some off the other side. But notice how you're maintaining control of those marabou fibers. There, now they're in the dubbing loop. We're going to twist this tool, and in the process we're going to be twisting up the marabou into that loop as well. Make sure we get it wound up really good. Kind of run your finger along there if you need to, just to make sure that the fibers aren't caught. And we're ready to wrap. Now this tool also just sort of rotates, so you can it's easy to work it around the hook and wrap this material forward. Now you notice how this is starting to point forward. What you want to do is you kind of dress it back, just like you were dressing back a hackle collar, and then each turn forward kind of work that back and it makes that fall into line a lot better. We'll just need to kind of, those last ones aren't quite tight enough so we'll uh, tighten them up a little bit. And we're getting close to the front end but we keep dressing those fibers back because you should be able to get, on this number 10 that I'm tying, you should be able to get about three clips, as I call it, of, of, of those fibers off the uh, marabou stem. Now on the size that you want to tie this thing for fishing, you probably want it in sizes about 14 to 18. Most of the time we tie ours in 16 and then that only takes about one application of the of the material to the loop. Anyway, all right, now you see how this is just all fuzzed up? We have to trim that and I find that whip finishing off the thread makes that job a little easier. So we'll just whip it off and then we'll come back and add it on again a little bit later. Okay, we'll start by just trimming across the top. Well, that's one of the nice things about this, this rotary vise, uh, the Dan vise, and you can get that from Greycliff, by the way. They have it for sale, and you just rotate, turn, and, and, and clip. And you'll find that this uh, makes this operation one heck of a lot easier. I'm going to tell you, the um, marabou does not trim nearly as easy as all materials like deer hair and stuff like that, but it still trims up pretty good. We have a couple of stray ones there, but they'll come clear here in a bit. We'll see how they are after we rib it. And I'm going to counter rib through this material. All that does is provide some segmentation after the fly is wet. This thing just really works and undulates in the water, and we're going to We've got that wrapped forward. Let's go ahead and attach our, our tying thread. And then we'll just tie off that ribbing material. Now we get to the eyes. Now remember those eyes we melted just a little bit ago? Well, they're still in our tool. Let's just slide those forward a little bit in the tool. And if you have trouble, and I have that same problem sometimes, is these, these tweezers will hold because they only open when you press on them. And I find it, it really helps to tie those tools, those eyes down, if you kind of get them anchored there before you pull the tweezers away. Now you can just kind of position them the way you want and do a couple of crisscross wraps up at the front end here. There we go. Now those eyes look really good. And I'll tell you what, the, the eyes are extremely predominant on the mysis shrimp. It just really shows up and so it's an important thing. Now we're going to cross under this eye, come up and over the hook, down and under the eye, up and over, and what that does is anchors 
all of these these eyes in place. It really makes them sit right where they where they need to. Now they weren't they were a little bit far forward. You notice I took my thumb nail and pushed them back to position them so that they're in the middle of the head area. Now I'm going to get a little bit more of my dubbing wax. And just take another piece of this marabou. And we're just going to cut it off, set the feather and everything aside, and dub on the part that we, we took off. And we're going to noodle dub that to form the head. And it, doesn't, and it, and it wants to get too fluffy, so you can grab your thread and the material and tighten it up a bit. There. Now we've got extra here that we don't need. Well, it'll come right back off. We'll just get rid of that. Got one wild one. We'll get rid of that. And we'll get our whip finish tool. Bring it into play to finish off the head. And there you've got a completed uh, rollover mysis shrimp. Anywhere in any tailwater fishery or fisheries where the mysis has been added, this rollover will really increase your success. Enjoy. I'm Heather LaFontaine Ellison and my father Gary LaFontaine will be speaking off camera while we tie the gold beadhead variation of the deep sparkle pupa. And the deep sparkle pupa is a, one of the old favorites of my father's and I've tied a ton of them and now you add the bead and it gets even better. So go ahead and put the bead on the hook. And the reason we had to tie a bead head variation, uh, the bead head craze came after the publication of Caddis Flies and people started putting the bead on. And we, we still do tie the original um, uh, non-bead um, deep sparkle pupa. I like the fish, I, I like both patterns. I fish the deep sparkle pupa, the regular one, uh, dead drift. Um, but then I'll fish the uh, the beadhead variation uh, when I'm fishing a swinging fly. Uh, I, I love the way it cuts through the water, uh, the way you cast a cross stream and you just men, men, men and go ahead and fish it. Okay, so you take the sparkle yarn, go ahead and cut a few pieces, about one and a half times the length of the shank of the hook. Then it's four ply fiber, so you're going to separate out each of the plies. And this is a size 12 hook that we're using for demonstration. And then you go ahead and use just a, a small bristled comb of any type, and go ahead and comb those out. Now you can sp sparse, sparse this out a little bit, Heather, just to show them how you would if it was a smaller hook than this. Okay. For size 12, you don't need to, but usually you just take a little bit out of there. So if it was a size 14, you throw a little bit away, size 16, a little bit more. Okay. This fly has to be sparse. You've got to be able to see through this over body because you're going to put an underbody underneath. Okay, so then you just tie this top one in like a tail. And this is going to end up being the overbody. You're going to fold this over. Tie your second one in as if you're tying in a tail. But then go ahead and pull it down around. Now what are you imitating with the deep sparkle pupa or the gold bead deep sparkle pupa? You're imitating the caddis pupa as it cuts its way out of the shuck and it swims its way up to the surface. Go ahead and use tacky dubbing wax to, with the touch dubbing. It makes it a lot easier than the low tack wax. And touch dubbing is simply the sparkle yarn chopped up very fine. And you just pat it on, on the thread. And 
go ahead and make your underbody. Thin, sparse. Don't fight the sparseness. Okay. You're going to pull this forward. Spread it out. Don't worry about it being perfectly spread because you're going to pull and spread with the, with the scissors point if you need to. You do want to make sure when you pull this forward that it's not twisted though. Otherwise it's not going to spread very well. You want it to be, go ahead and let it be straight. Then pull with your scissors point. Now the top one, Heather has spread pretty well, but now she's just going to spread the bottom one and spread that out a little bit. And that is just about perfect. There okay. aren't any open gaps in that. Go ahead and clip off these ends. They don't need to be really neat. You're going to cover them up. Tie them down. And here you use normal synthetic dubbing and you noodle dub. For this color variation you use a brown synthetic dubbing. And you just make a little collar here. Really easy. And whip finish right behind the bead. Pull tight. And you're done. And that is the gold bead variation of the Deep Sparkle Pupa. This next fly is called the stub wing bucktail. This is a streamer's fly, uh, streamer fly. It's a real flashy color and the Gary uses this in streams. He says this gets some real strong solid takes if it's fished on a slow steady retrieve. It shouldn't be erratic at all. It features eyes at the back of the hook which increase hookups because that's where the fly is or the fish is going to hit the fly. He keys on the eyes so we put it back toward the hook so we can actually hook them a little bit better. Although this fly is called the stub wing bucktail, it does not feature any bucktail on the fly at all. We asked Gary about this and Gary says it's called a stub wing bucktail because it's tied in the old bucktail streamer fashion. Let me show you how to tie this. Okay, starting out with a TMC 7999 number four Atlantic salmon hook and I'm gonna cover the shank with thread. Stop the thread right above the barb and then wrap back just a little ways and I'm going to tie in some Antron yarn to be used as the tail. I want this Antron yarn to be about the length of the gap of the hook. I'll tie that in and comb out those fibers. I want to separate all those fibers so this thing will move in the water. The next thing I'll do after moving my thread up to the front is wrap the body with the Antron yarn. I'm going to build up a spot right in the back so I have plenty of space for my eye. Then I'll bring the yarn forward to about the halfway and tie it off. The next thing I'm going to do is take some zap -a gap and put a drop right on the back of the Antron yarn and take a doll's eye and stick it right to the back of the fly. I have an oversized eye which is going to give that trout something to key on when he strikes this fly. And I'll put another eye on the other side. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is tie in 
a piece of white marabou and I'll tie it in right in front of the body and let it extend back to the end of the tail. And trim off the excess. Now I'll go back to my Antron yarn, tie it in and wrap the rest of the body. Okay, after I tie down the Antron yarn, I'm going to put in a beard of yellow wool fibers that'll go underneath the hook as a throat. The next thing I need is another piece of marabou this time. I'm going to tie in some olive marabou that will be tied in and extended back to the end of the tail. And then for a topping, I'll use some green crystal flash and I'll get 15 or 20 fibers. Lay this on top of the hook and let it extend back to the end of the marabou. Tie it in and let it separate as I wrap with the thread. After trimming off the excess, now I need to build up the head of the fly with this black thread and whip finish. And the stub wing bucktail is complete. Although we all enjoy fishing with grasshoppers, ants, flying ants. They're kind of sporadic at best and the grasshopper has such a splash when it hits the water it's very distinctive. But the terrestrial that we find in the water the most is a beetle and it is a very consistent food force source for fish even during the winter. You need a very subtle beetle pattern and then in addition to that you need the pattern I'm going to tie today. And the difference is, is that this pattern has a clear, or well not a clear, but a uh, packing foam uh, wing on it. And it is very good to use during the morning and evening hours. But on a bright sunny day, I don't recommend it as it looks a little unnatural to the fish during that time. But you can actually have a fish who's feeding on mayflies, for example, come over and take the beetle. A beetle will break um, a feeding uh, pattern in a fish. So try this some evening. It's a wonderful fishing uh, fly and uh, we use it consistently. It's also easy to tie. We'll start this pattern um, now with just by getting our hook in. We're going to again be using a size 10. We'll start this fly with a base wrap of black thread since we're going to be using a peacock for our body. The black thread makes a nice base wrap. Um, we need to put on a hackle and this is a grizzly hackle dyed olive. So we'll just get a few fibers cleaned off of the end here and attach it and then just leave it hanging. I've selected some peacock and I'm going to, uh, well I think I'll use maybe about three of these, that probably should be enough. Trim off some of the heavier ends here. 
Now normally you'd be tying this beetle in a lot smaller size, so you probably wouldn't have to use quite as much peacock as I'm using, but I have seen some big beetles out there too. Some of those big old pine beetles are big ornery looking things, so you might want to make uh, a fairly large fly if that's what you've got in your uh, neck of the woods. We're just going to twist this around, tie it off, trim the excess. That was just about the right amount of peacock I had there. Now we want to palmer this hackle through our peacock, tie it off, Now we're going to uh, trim the top and the bottom of this a bit. The top I trimmed a lot shorter than the bottom because I want my um, wing here to lie down. Now this, what this is, is a piece of packing foam and I have colored just one side of it and um, have put, uh, of course, the Aquaflex over the top of that. and. Uh, I'm going to just make this a little bit more slender here where I want to tie it on. And we want the black side down. So we'll just hold this right on the top, take a wrap. Yeah, you know what, folks, that's a little too long. I forgot to measure. We want it just to come to the bend right about here. There we go. That's much better. We had an ill-formed beetle there for a moment. Now we'll just take some whip finishes right there. We probably need a little glue normally right in there. I'm just going to take this and trim it, similar to what we would do a caddis. And we have a foam beetle. Last year, while attending the Southeast Idaho Fly Tying Expo, I thought I was going just to watch my husband do a demonstration. However, Al Beatty, using the charm that he has, talked me into being a demonstrator. Well, once again, he's turned on the charm and he's talked me into tying one of his favorite flies. So bear with me, it's only the second time I've ever tied this fly. I'm going to attempt to tie the Double Magic Soft Hackle. So let's give this a shot. Okay, I'm going to start my base wrap just about an eye length behind. I'm going to wrap down just to the band. Trim off the excess. I've got a tag here already for me on my clip. I'm going to use the gold side because I like the gold better. couple of loose wraps there. Now I'm going to flip the vise and take two, three, maybe four wraps just over the bend and then back up. I'm going to tie that off. off the excess. I'm going to bring my thread all the way forward back to the tie-in point or the beginning. And I'm going to take some peacock. Oh, I've got probably six or eight swords here or pieces. And I want to kind of line these tips up. They don't have to be perfectly lined up. I'm going to lay them in here. Tie them in there. Off the excess. And then I'll wrap this down. Now 
Okay, now for this next step, I want to get some of my BT's wax here. I'm going to touch dub some Antron. I just have to lightly touch this. Oh, yeah. It picks it up really nice. Okay, now I'm going to. First couple of wraps, I want to get the Antron right up, even with the peacock. Okay, now I'm going to take the peacock and the Antron, bring it out from the eye. You don't want to hold too tight and just start to rotate the vise. And look at that, that's bringing it all together, making a really nice mix. Okay, now I'm ready to wrap it on the hook. I just bring it towards me and just continue wrapping. Okay, now I'm ready to tie that off. Kind of separate the peacock and the thread again. Trim off the excess, and then we'll wrap forward, just kind of wrap a rib through the fly. Okay, my final step, I'm going to take a hen hackle, strip back some of the fibers. right side forward. I'm going to tie that in right in front of the peacock. Trim off that stem that's left there. I don't have my hackle pliers, so it's long enough. I'm just going to wrap it by hand. Stroke those fibers back. Tie that off. Trim off the excess. Now let's finish this up, give it a nice head there. Make sure those fibers are back. And I'm going to whip finish this just a half hitch, a couple of half hitches, whoops, trapped a fiber there, we'll get that out of there. And there you have Al's favorite fly, the Double Magic Soft Hackle. Flex Hex is another one of Gary's series of, of flies tied on the flexible hooks. A two-part hook, the back part is a hook, and the front part is a clip. Now we're going to uh, work with Cree Hackle as per the recipe. But let's talk about some substitutes, because the real world is, is not all of us have Cree Hackle in our inventory. A Grizzly Brown mix works really well, or a Grizzly that has been dyed light brown. You know, if you ha can get just the writ brown, that works pretty well. So those are just some, some options for you. Or you just take a brown felt tip marker and take a grizzly and color it. And it'll give you something very close to Cree. Uh, but that Cree has a nice subtle color and, and we'll, uh, we'll be using it on the pattern. We'll also be using uh, some mallard. And you want the smaller uh, feather rather than the really long fibered feather. <clears throat> and you'll see why here in just a moment. Uh, we're using CLX. The really bright yellow CLX is what you want. And we're using packing foam that's been colored. And in this particular case, we colored it with some of our Aqua Tough or Aqua Head. Either one would work fine. Gretchen just discovered that today. Up, up until then, we've always used a marking pen and then some Aqua Flex. But the uh, makes a really good looking 
piece of foam when you use that aqua tough or aqua head and it colors the colors at the same time as applying the 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 stuff but let's get started putting this pattern together by applying a thread a base starting oh about a quarter back on the hook shank now once we get to the back of the hook we're going to trim off this excess and don't throw that away you want a fairly long piece of thread Set that back in your material keeper for a moment. You're going to use that to split the tail here just that after we get the tail put on. Now the tail is the grizzly hackle fibers. And we'll just kind of dress out some fibers off, off this tail or off this uh, feather and prepare to tie on our tail. And it's just bound into place right there at the end of the shank. And we'll just leave that here now. We're going to bring this piece of th thread that we saved into play. And we bring it around the bend and kind of get it all evened up and then pull it to the back and it's used to just slide up between those tail fibers and divide those. And we cinch them down. Make it spread just as far as you want. We'll get rid of the uh, excess here. <coughs> Now this fly is a really messy looking fly, but it really provides a great silhouette of the mayfly as the mayfly enters the trout's window of, of observation. Now I'm going to tie on the packing foam right now. Let me just trim off a piece of this. Kind of, there we go. Just bind that into, into place and just wrap to the back of the hook. <clears throat> We'll just set that back in our material keeper for, for reference right now and get out our dubbing wax. And we're going to use CLX dubbing. We'll just pull some of that out. And it's kind of a wiry sort of a stuff. So we're just going to just kind of nurse it out of the package until we get what looks like will be enough to do the job. And then just stick it to our thread. And it just kind of, that wax will just grab that stuff. You see, it's kind of stuck in place there. And then we'll just twist in one direction, getting the application of dubbing onto the hook. Now, here we go. Just putting in the body. Notice how I kind of touch that with my finger? It sets that CLX into place, and it's not quite as loosely dubbed that way. We're just going to sh shape the body just a little bit right there at the front and then pull over the packing foam and bind that into position. Now moving into the next part of the fly, the application of the hackle, the way Gary ties the fly, I'll describe to you as I set up to tie it in a different manner. He ties the hackle on right here at this position, wraps it forward, then winds the thread back through the hackle to end up at that position to put a little another application of dubbing. Well, that seems kind of cumbersome to me, so I am going to tie those feathers on at the front and then uh, wrap back so I end up at the place where I wanted to be in the first place. <clears throat> Get these extra fibers off this mallard. There we go. And we'll tie that into place right there at the front. Nope, that didn't quite set right. Let me try that one more time. There we go, that's going to be better. Need to have a little bit of bare stem there so we don't foul the eye of the hook. And now we'll take our saddle feather and trim off some of that darker stuff and just bind that into place right there at the front. See how I bent that stem over? Now I'm going to wrap the, the dry fly hackle first, several turns. Tie it off, trim off the excess, set that aside because we're going to use what's left of that on our head, but we'll worry about that here in a few minutes. But for right now, we're going to have to use the hackle pliers to put on the mallard. And we want the fibers to be dressed forward, the reverse of what you would with a hackle collar. So we'll go ahead and just start wrapping those and keeping them forward as we go. Working them through that cree until we get to the back. 
Now I know that looks like a mess at this point, but we're gonna fix it up here just a little bit. This is the way it's got, got to be swept forward. Now we're going to finish that process by putting dubbing in behind here to put kind of a dubbed collar, if you will, just to finish off the fly. <clears throat> but Gary says it's, a, it's extremely important that that mallard hackle be cupped forward. Let me pull out just a little bit more dubbing here. And put that on the thread. Uh, you see it just kind of pulls those those fibers, hackle fibers forward. You see how they just kind of all come forward and that's the way they need to be. Let me get my uh, half hitch tool. In fact those fibers tend to get in the way of my half hitch tool and this might be a good place to do a hand whip. Gets around those fibers just a little bit easier. Bring that clip into play right now. We'll just kind of ease that through. I'll turn it your way so you can see kind of what's going on here and get that stuck through there. Now we'll take the fly out of the vise. We'll let our the point of our hook, if it slides down between those jaws, makes it a lot less dangerous to deal with. We'll pull these fibers back, get that clip into the... Now let me warn you, putting the clip into the jaws of the vise, the clip is smaller around than the hook, so it'll slip unless you tighten the jaws. So we'll uh, do that. <coughs> And we'll tie our thread on here at the front just to close the, that eye. Wrap back to close up the back eye. That's good. With that closed, leave the, the thread hanging just to the front of the curved part of that clip that's in the, in the jaws of the vise. Let me lay down my whisk clips for a moment because a, a standard scissors works better for the next operation and that is to cut a couple of strips of foam that are about as wide as the gap of the hook. We'll just cut those two off like that. Set aside the other piece. Set down one and I'll get rid of these scissors and I'll go back to my whisk clips and I'll just kind of Cut a bit of a point there. And let's go ahead and tie this on on the underneath side of the hook. Okay, we'll just kind of pull that down and leave it there for the moment. And we've got a fiber captured, and let's get that uncaptured. There we go. That really does look like a mess, doesn't it? Well, it's all right. It's what the trout thinks it is, not uh, what we think of the, of the way the fly looks. And we cut a point on the other one, and we'll tie it on the, on the top. All right. Now, let's get that hackle feather left over from the hackle in the back, and we'll tie it on and put a hackle on the front. And make sure that you go up and over and back into this part right here, because that's what we're going to want to tie off. We'll just wrap our hackle forward. That Cree is sure some pretty hackle, but like I say, there's a lot of alternatives that you can have. Probably just a straight grizzly would work fine too when you get right down to it. It mixes in fine with that um, with that mallard on the back part of the fly, and I'm not sure that you really need Cree, but if you've got it, use it, and if you don't, then I guess you don't. Now let's go ahead and tie off the bottom one first. There we go, and just kind of cinch that up. Oh, whoops, I see we have a problem arising here. Let me get my bodkin out, and we've got one caught. Let's get that out of there. Yeah, that's better now. I'll bind that into place, and we'll just trim that up, set that aside. Now let's bring the other one forward and take a couple of turns over it. And let's use the rotating function of the vise to make sure we didn't capture any more of those fibers. They get kind of, they can get kind of crazy there and okay we'll trim off the excess here then as well. Set that aside for another fly. Got a little bit crooked, I'll just trim it over there. 
we'll get our half hitch <clears throat> our whip finish tool and put on a good whip finish and the flex hex is complete now let's kind of get that hook back into the vise get those fibers dressed forward like they're supposed to be because that's the way Gary wants it let me get my body to support it and you can just see what that flex hex looks like looks like a mess but boy it does the job First of all, we had the gold-ribbed hare's ear. Then Gary LaFontaine added Antron to the hare's mask, and we had a sparkling hare's ear. Then I read a book by John Gearock called Good Flies, and I saw a hare's ear that he tied with dark eyes on it. And so I put all three of those together, and I'll submit to you the black-eyed sparkling hare's ear. I'll start my base wrap and cover the hook with some dark brown thread. For the tail for this hare's ear, I'm going to use Hungarian partridge. I'm going to let that stick out about two-thirds the length of the hook shank. The next material I put on the hook will be the rib, and in this case I'm going to use a copper wire. I'll make sure that's tied down securely on the far end, far side of the hook. And now I'm going to start with a blend of hair's mask and Antron, and you can see that sparkle right there of the Antron. I'm going to dub on a thin abdomen. I'll wrap that up to about halfway up the hook shank. and then rib it with the wire. These wraps of the wire are going to be evenly spaced so as to provide segmentation for the fly as well as a little flash. And I'll tie off the wire right at that point. And I'll cut that with the back end of my scissors so I won't ruin the points. Okay, the next thing I do is I'm going to come up into about one-third of the hook shank behind the eye, and I'm going to tie in some bead chain. Now, this bead chain, according to John Gearock's formula, I blackened it using some nickel blackener. And then I dropped it, and I can't find it. Oop, here we go. Okay, I'm going to lay it on the hook shank, and then using some Xing patterns, I'll wrap it right onto the hook shank. Okay, in order to lock it into place, I'll make some, some wraps under the eye, but over the hook shank, and then do some more X's back and forth. And if I need to, I can also put a drop of super glue right on the eye. The next thing I'm going to do is bring my Antron and or my hair's ear and sparkle yarn blend right up behind the eye and then I'm going to tie in a soft tackle. Now what I've got here is a partridge feather that I've trimmed off all the fluff. I'm going to pull the fibers back and then cut off the point leaving a little stub sticking out. I'll tie this in right behind the eyes with the bright side of the feather facing forward. Then as I attach my hackle pliers, 
I'll hold those up and stroke the fibers back with my left hand and wrap. The leading edge of the wrap will be the stem of this soft tackle. And I'll tie that off right behind the eyes. Okay, then going into my dubbing blend again, I'm going to dub the thorax and the head of the fly. And now I want to crisscross through the eyes. Right behind the eyes, I'll, ta I'll take some wraps, making sure that I completely cover the head of the fly. And I'll whip finish at that point. Okay, a little Antron, a little hair's mask, some dark eyes, and some Antron. The gold ribbed, or the uh, black eyed sparkling hairs here. Terrestrials aren't always on the water, and so sometimes we neglect to carry a good supply of terrestrials. But when they do hit the water, it is a really exciting fishing experience and one of my favorites. Last weekend, we just happened to be on Cascade Lake, or reservoir, in Idaho, and there were flying ants everywhere, and uh, the fishing was so much fun. It's just amazing. We also have had the experience of a lot of flying ants in North Idaho on Hayden Lake and Lake Pondere and all those lakes in the spring. Um, the ones last weekend were about a size 16, and what I'm going to do today is probably going to be a larger one like I saw more in North Idaho. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, tie it in a size 10, and we'll use black. Now what we use for the body is just like we did on the ant and the spider. We take a packing foam, use a Panatone or a magic marker, color the foam, and then you've got to seal that color in with some Aquaflex. If you don't seal the color in, it will come off on your fingers and in the water and just doesn't work. So we prepare a lot of this ahead of time and uh, then we have it all ready when we want to tie. So that's what I'm going to use today. So let's get started. This is such a simple pattern, I feel like I need to talk longer, but we'll go ahead and tie it even though it's real quick. We're just going to take a couple of wraps right here in the center that's all we need for a base wrap just to give us a little platform here so we can tightly attach this foam. We just take the foam and attach it right here in the center of the hook with some wraps. Nothing magic about this. And now we want to um, fold the foam over so it's about just slightly behind the eye. Trim the excess, and we'll do the same thing over here, so that it's about even with the bend. Right there, hold it in place, trim the excess. Now this is what makes it the flying out. We're going to take some of this clear Antron, and we don't need very much. We're going to tie it on. The, the piece is going to be about half the amount that we want to use. And the reason we do it this way is because it's a little more durable than trying to tie on the end pieces. So we just tie it on like this, fold it over, and now it's not going to pull out. And that gives us a wing, and we'll just trim it off. Let's whip finish that right there in the middle. And you can take this fly out if you've got flying ants on your lake or stream and have a really good time.
Well, after getting that hook in the vise, it's time to do some experimenting. I've often fished a muddler minnow. It's one of my favorite flies. You know, it's come through in times when I would, wasn't too sure that, that it was going to. You know, you, all of you out there, I know you've got a fly that's come through for you, and another one that's come through for me is a spruce fly streamer. Well, I'm gonna put those together, and I'm gonna take Gary's concept of the flex hook, and we're gonna end up with a spruce fly muddler that's tied on a flex hook. And maybe I'll throw in a couple of other little tips and tricks as we move down the line. For those of you out there in viewing land, we're gonna show you how to always have matched up wings for your muddlers, even though you never have them. Okay, but going forward from there, let's take a, a closer look at this hook, and I'll start dressing the, um, the, the shank with a, with a base wrap, and I'm going to wrap right. down to the bend and stop. I'm gonna put a tag on this fly. No reason except I had that stuff laying here in front of me and I, well, there's no reason to let it go to waste, so we'll put a tag on the fly. Otherwise, that doesn't make any difference whether we really have a tag on it or not. Okay, and the tag is a lot easier to apply if you'll take this rotary vise and uh, just kind of tilt it up, get a better look at things. Now, the tail on a muddler can be a real pain in the neck because you're trying to match up a couple of uh, matched quills from a set of quills. Well, I'll tell you what I have here. I'm just gonna hold them up here so you can kind of see. We're just gonna go the full length. Here's one. Excuse me, let, let's get this one first. This one is completely shorter, totally different kind of a, of a thing. And we're gonna use those. First off, we're gonna show you a trick. And I'm just gonna get in here close. And Pull that back, that's junk anyway. And we're gonna take a really big slip of this turkey tail and pull that out and give it a cut. I'm just gonna go reach off screen here and trim that off. And what we're gonna do is, you know, these fibers will marry and they were all crooked and now we've kind of evened them up. Well, what we're gonna do now is I don't have a bodkin laying in front of me and that's cool because we'll use something else. I've got this and I'll just lay my bobbin in front of me and bend that down over and then I'll let that bobbin hang back down there. And what I have effectively done is folded that feather. And now I have the match quills that I needed for my tail. Well, let's just set those in place. Let me back up here so I get a good start that tail. Now, just like you're setting the wings on a wet fly is like the way, is the way you set the tail and I just tighten that up, and you see how that tail jumps right into position there. Now, each subsequent turn going forward angles and lays in flat, keeping the fibers of the tail crushed evenly. Now, I wanna to talk to you for a minute also. This is not floss that I'm using. This is size A unwaxed Danville thread. We'll just get all the way forward. And that makes an incredibly smooth floss tight body. I'll just trim that off. And let me show you another trick. If the body isn't quite as smooth as you want it, and that body looks pretty good, I'm gonna reach up here with my fingers and grab the standing end, and now it leaves me a loose barrel. And it's got a smooth edge, and I'll just kinda polish the sides of that floss, and it will really smooth it up. Now I've kind of messed up the tail and you say to yourself, oh darn, no way, don't worry about it. See, that's why we use the process of marrying wing or quill fibers to make it the way we want it. Anyway, we need to have some peacock on here for the uh, front part of this spruce fly muddler. Now we could be tying this double magic style, but we're not gonna overdo that on, on our tape. We're just gonna put it on standard style. However, Double Magic is really, really awesome. It's all you do is just add a little bit of Antron dubbing along with this and mix the Peacock with the Antron. But for right now, we're just using Gary's concept and use of the flex hook to produce a living, moving muddler, if you will. You know, it's an awful effective fly, but it sure don't move very much. And I found that using them with the flex hooks can be really 
really pr productive. All right. Now, we don't have to go very far because we're only going to put a somewhat of a thorax over this red floss, if you will. We're going to stop right about there. Bind it into position and then rib forward with that red floss. Gives it some highlights. It gives it a red highlight as it gets wet. Now we need an underwing and most muddlers have an underwing and everything under the sun has been used for muddler underwings and I happen to have squirrel laying on the tail, table here so we're going to use a squirrel underwing. And I don't know if I got a hair stacker around here and if I don't, I won't stack it and if I can find one real quick, I will. It really is kind of mox nicks because I want you to notice something. Yeah, there's a stacker there, but that tail fibers that come off of the squirrel tail have almost a natural silhouette to them. I think I'm just going to go ahead and put them on without stacking them. Let's get them out so that they're pretty close to the end of the tail. We'll just bind them into position. Okay, that make them up nice and tight. Trim off the uh, excess there. And I'm going to have to whip finish it at this point. That'll be our underwing. The, f the top wing is going to be constructed on the other part of the hook. We'll get to that in a second for right now. Let's just put that whip finish on. Trim off the excess and I do want to get a little bit of, of glue on there and I got some of my Walmart type crazy glue and we're going to just put a dab of that on there just to make sure that that squirrel, that can be some real contrary stuff, but you know it's funny, super glue really changes its attitude. Trim off just a couple of wild ones we got here. I got some of that on my fingers, I better get it off or I'll really be embarrassed here in front of all of you. Well, we need to put our, our clippy on for the flexible head. And I'm having a hard time lining that up, so let me just turn it up here and it will come in from this direction. That way I can see what I'm doing. There we go. Now, we're going to continue tying out into this area, but first we're going to remove the hook itself from the vise. And now we're just going to leave the point of the hook down there and see how it slips in between those jaws? Let it lay in there and just catch the top part now of the clip and we'll push this down in there so it stays and it'll pretty well stay out of your way. Now these clips never do line up. The top part here doesn't quite line up with the little looped part. So I always just give them a push like that so that they kind of line up a bit. And now let's go ahead and, and tie on our red floss slash size A type. And that's not quite tight enough. The hook is a little bit bigger around than the clip so I'll just tighten the jaws. Make sure I still get the point of my hook down into, the, into those jaws. It, you know, the first couple times I tied on these flex hooks, I uh, managed to stab myself pretty good a couple times. But anyway, wings. We're going to do just another wing like we did before. And that is we're just going to take one big slip of turkey. Just as much as I can cut. And we're going to dress the fibers back so that they, see how you, with the marrying process, you can realign the fibers so that they become fairly even. Even enough so that the fish don't really give a darn. We'll just make the rest of this just like it is. And you know when I left my bodkin in the fly tying room, and that's okay, because we'll just fold it anyway. See how those wings fold? We'll just kind of ease them down in line with the tail and cinch them into place and bind them and bind them down. And that just makes them fall right in line with the tail and the and the under wing. See how they all kind of come together? I better get a couple more wraps in there. It's not quite tight enough. This is where it's real easy to lose the whole process. And I'll trim that one off and we'll advance into the next part of the fly. Well, I'll just trim this hair off and I'm going to clean the under fur out. And if you rapidly move your finger up and down through that, that'll really clean that fur out. Let me move off screen though and do it in the, in the wastebasket. It keeps my wife a lot happier with me if I do it that way. Now I always put my hair in the stacker backwards and everybody asks me why, but you know this end isn't stacked. That's why I'm putting it in the stacker. That end right there is already even, so it's pretty easy to get it in the stacker. Once in a while, there's a wild one that doesn't want to cooperate, and that's what the wastebasket's for. 
Anyway, excuse the tapping, but I need to stack that clump of hair. Now I have to warn you on something, and it's thanks to Paul who warned me about it, that spinning hair on these um, flex hooks can be kind of a pain in the neck. Let me show you what we're going to do. We're going to do a wide open spiral into the middle bare part of the, of the flex portion there. Now let's uh, go ahead and trim off this, and I'll move off camera again to trim that off right about there. And I'll just set it right down and squirm it, if you will, around that flex part of the hook. And now I'm just going to apply pressure. It's going under pressure, and it's spinning. Now what that does is it allows room to spin, and now we're going to push back so that it's tied up against the curved part of the clip. That gets our, our shall we say, the, the collar part in position without uh, being a big problem. Now from here, we're just going to take clumps of hair. We don't have to stack them or anything like that. Uh, just off camera, we'll knock out some of the fuzz. And we're going to go ahead and spin a couple more spins until we get to the point where we're ready to trim this head. We'll cut off that excess there and work my way through. And I can probably get another spin in there before I start. You know, one of the things that running into that little point right there can be kind of a pain in the neck. But we'll work our way around it. Sometimes you're going to have to do a flare in place to finish off. Depends on just how it all comes together. Anyway, it's one more spin, and uh, it's going to work its way around that point just fine. Now, I'm going to have to work in front of this hair. And we got to close that last little loop on the front part here, and we're going to do that. See how that puts kind of a pretty little red nose on our, on our uh, muddler? or whatever color you use when you're tying. Whoops, let me back up one turn. There's no reason to capture those and, and make a mess. I'll trim those out. That's why God gave us scissors, is to get rid of contrary pieces of tying material. Okay, and we'll just finish that with another whip. Let's trim it off. And now it's time to trim our head. I'll lay that aside first. I like to trim my head flat along the bottom. And that's exactly what we're going to do here, flat along. Just so it kind of, the trim fibers are about the same length at the back here as that little hook coming out of the clippy. All right, now I'm going to angle the scissors slightly and just start working my way around. You know the rotary function is just really great for that. We'll just keep keep turning, keeping the scissors angled as we work our way around. And you know, it's isn't it amazing how that head just kind of jumps out of all that big old mess of hair. Anyway, now we have hair that's back into the collar, and we're going to trim one more time around, shortening them up somewhat, and then we'll show you how to take care of the last of them. Now, the last of them, starting at the bottom. Lay the scissors in flat, push back the collar fibers, and then come in and make a trim. Push the, do the same thing, just working your way around. Make a trim. And make a trim. I'll try to keep the, the um, vise fairly flat for you as we come through here and push them back, make a trim. And we'll just keep doing that. Anyway, just speed the process up here. You, are, you should already have the idea. And there we've got it. I got a wild hair right there. I'll just turn it around, make sure we've got them all. Make sure that ridge doesn't look too bad. And there's a spruce fly muddler. It's ready to go fishing. the wilderness is beautiful. You need to share it with your friends. For me, it's Dubbin. For Gary, it was Chester and Zeb. You also want to make sure that your friends get lots of hydration because they work hard running around here. And don't forget yourself. It's a good idea to carry water when you're in the backcountry and drink often. Well, there you have it, folks. That's volume number six. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Remember the words from Gary, keep yourself hydrated in the backcountry and use those flies, they're good.
Enjoy. Everybody here will leave one straggler to drag along anybody that comes late. And it's about a 10 minute walk. It's on a trail, sort of. <laughs> and we have a little flagging, but if we all sort of do it to the trail, we always have somebody in sight. We'll probably get there with, and we'll only lose a few of you. Um, and so, what I'm proposing is we'll, if you've got a a, a light and portable <laughs> chair you want to drag along, or there's places you can sit on the ground and a few logs, or if you want to stand. Um, but we probably ought to go ahead and start walking that way. So if you're game, let's go for it. wander up and down it and see why. What we'd like to do today is do what Gary would like to do. Spend some time on this river, talk about Gary, trade stories, hopefully laugh a lot, because that's what, outside of fishing, I think Gary liked to laugh and tell bad jokes as much as he did anything else. And I think he would find it very much in his honor if we do the same thing on this day that we are here for him. So. What we'd like to do is there are a few people who um, were very close to Gary that will have a few short remarks, and we'll let those folks start out. And then what we'd like to do is, and if we need to move back into the berm a little to let people talk, let people just share some of their own memories or anecdotes or stories um, and reminisce for an hour or so. And, and then back at the parking lot, We'll have a picnic for people, for people that want to hang around. And I think Jay Godreau, Gary's brother, is planning on walking up to the, the famous Pack Bridge that Gary always liked to walk into. And if people, after lunch, want to take a hike up the trail to the Pack Bridge, it's a very pretty smooth, flat walk. Um, it's a nice walk. Or wander up and down the river. Um, just hang out and enjoy this place. Um. I knew that Gary had a lot of offbeat friends. I, I just didn't know a lot of, so many of you would be here today. But uh, Gary did have some wonderful friends. And, uh, that I think is one of the one of the great things about his life. He was just a real outgoing guy. He would uh, help anybody, and uh, he was a great big brother to me, and like a father. And I followed him out here from Connecticut, and it's, it's been a long, long road. But uh, when we talked about today, a year or so ago, he just wanted us to go fishing. So if anybody wants to go up to the bridge later, I'll take you up there. And that's what Gary wanted to do. And um, I hope some of you will join us. And it's about a three-hour, it's about a three-hour, well, it's about a, 
an hour walk, a little over an hour. It's pretty easy. That was Gary's favorite spot. We did a lot of fishing up here. We camped up here. And I, I know he just wanted to share that with all of you. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Kind of? <laughs> okay. I'm Heather LaFontaine Ellison, Gary's daughter. And I just wanted to say a few words today in thanks for coming everybody and I just wanted to say that to point out the importance of this occasion as a celebration rather than as a sad event my father had a, an amazing life and he lived more in 40, 54 years than most people do in a hundred and he lived for fly fishing for the friends he made during his life and everything he did even as a father as a friend as a running coach as as anything he did passionately and did it well and I think that even in death he is as full a person as he was in life and I just want to say that in his travels with the traveling fly fisherman, he met so many people and over the years, otherwise guiding everything he did, he met so many people and so many of you are here today. And I think that it's a good culmination of his life. I think that during the five years that he had ALS, I can't say that it was all a good thing, but there were some very wonderful things. He met some very important people to him in those last years. And also, he got back as much as he gave during the rest of his life. Everybody came forward for him to give donations to the cause, to help him. Everyone wrote to him, and it really made him feel like he had really done his job well and had lived well. And so I appreciate that of all of you and I appreciate the fact that you have all come today. And I hope that all of you can, I'm sure that all of you have as wonderful of stories as, as Jack and Mike have told. And I have a ton of them, but I won't, I won't spend all of your time here doing it. But um, just thanks again, and I really, really appreciate you all. For those that don't know me, I'm Mike Lawson. Uh, I've known Gary for probably about 30 years. The first time I ever met Gary, I was at a the first fly fishing conclave I ever went to and was just kind of blown away by all the fly fishing personalities that were there and celebrities and riders and whatnot and uh, nobody really knew who I was and most of them that I saw would never venture to come and shake hands and talk unless I approached them and I was sitting there and Gary LaFontaine just walked up and said hi I'm Gary LaFontaine and uh, I was really impressed with that because he he was a staff writer at that time for Fly Fisherman Magazine and he just completed his first book, uh, The Challenge of the Trout. Like I said, he didn't care how he looked. You know, uh, the the three the three musketeers, the traveling fly fishermen. I think Jack and I spent part of our time tr trying to dress Gary and, and everything else and. Uh, you know, he just, you could buy him nice clothes and he looked like he just got out of bed as soon as he put him on. a wonderful team. And he had convinced me that we ought to do a video together. And I, I called Mike and he, he just says, boy, that sounds like a terrible idea. Which meant it's a great idea. So, so we met together on the Yellowstone and every time we got together as the three of us, from that time on, magic happened. A lot of it was because some pretty stimulating arguments over politics, 
between Mike and Gary. That was always the fun, most fun part, and, and, and so our discussions. But on that stream, the magic started. And then that magic started when a film crew came up and wanted to interview us all about what we thought about fishing. And it was a part of a TV special that went on to win an Emmy. So the first, the very first time together, we were an award-winning thing that we hadn't even planned. That Mike finally waits for another half an hour, 45 minutes, and decides he better go looking for him down at Delta. It was one of the few times he didn't fly in Delta. And there he found Gary and my son had sat there from 9 o'clock and were talking the whole entire time. The rest of the world could have fell apart. But he cared so much about people that the whole, he was so enwrapped in what they had to say, what they had to do, that the whole world could fall in. He could get on an airplane, pull up a book, and the plane could have been hijacked and he wouldn't have known. Because he loved whatever he was doing, he gave it his heart and soul. But little did we know, in Reno, about four years later, we're at a banquet. Mike was doing a speech. We're in the Golden Nugget at Reno, the Golden Nugget Casino. We're doing the banquet speech. And, and, he, and he leads over to me and said, man, I've heard this speech. Let's leave. So we're at the back table. So we leave, we leave Mike there. And we go on and he says, do you gamble? I said, I don't gamble. He said, I don't gamble. And he says, well, look, there's a game room. We walk in the game room and it's this huge game room. Every game in the world was in there, basketball, everything, skeet shooting, the whole thing. And there was air hockey. And he says, boy, that's air hockey. I am really good. <laughs> I go, yeah, yeah, Gary, sure. I, I, I bet you are really good. He goes, yep, no, I'm really good. I'm, in fact, I'm great. In fact, I'm one of the greatest in the world. <laughs> and I thought, I'm getting my, really getting my chain pulled here. And here's two airmen. They were two guys we found out that were naval fighter pilots at Fallon Air Force Base, one black, one white guy. And they're going at it, and he says, let's take them on. I go, come on. He says, yeah, we'll take them on, no problem. I said, I've never played it. He says, don't worry, I'm really great. We get over to these two guys, look at us, you know, they're about this tall, and they look at it, and they go, sure, for 20 bucks. So Gary gets it out. How many of you knew Gary in his wallet? He go, he go in there, and he'd take that wallet out, and he'd look through it, and, then he'd come out and he'd fall out and he never had any money in his wallet. You know, he found this $20 bill and he put that $20 bill out and these guys are all down with each other. And so I get, okay, Gary, okay, here we are. And, and the guy hits it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Gary's all, I look at him and he's in that concentration mode, like on the airplane. I said, Gary, did you see that? He says, I, I see that. Next one, wham, wham, wham. I said, Gary, he says, look, I'm just feeling in the whole situation out. They hit another one, and I go out there, I have to do something, and I just, I miss it, and it goes by, and he says, I got it. I said, you got what? He says, I got it all figured out. And we had this little conference back there. He sits down, that's the last point that those two airmen ever scored. We beat them three games, 60 bucks. They never scored a point. Gar I never hit one of them. Gary hit them all. Everything wiped him out. He was the greatest air hockey player that I've ever seen. And... So Mike comes trooping in, hey, why'd you guys leave the speech? It's all over with. And he goes, oh, he said, you know, we just had to come here. And he says, hey, I like air hockey, I'll play. And Gary says, well, I'll stand you too. And Mike looked over, that's not very fair. I said, believe me, Mike, it's very fair. <laughs> and Mike found out about it. So Mike says, look, I had to do the banquet speech. I got beat in air hockey. I got to figure something else that I can do. And he says, skeet shooting over there. We went over there to skeet shoot, and Gary, of course, six out of 25. Mike gets up 21, 22 out of 25, hands a gun to me and goes, and I go up there, shoot 25 out of 25, handing the gun back and say, sorry, Mike, but my dad was the Olympic skeet coach. <laughs> Met Gary later, uh, got to know Gary later, and what we were in the process of doing is between Al and Gretchen Beatty, me and my wife, Char, we're putting all of Gary's flies on tape. I'm always in awe of this guy, one of the greatest fly designers I've ever met. So we're sitting down, and I don't even recall what fly it is, but I said, okay, Gary, how do you tie this? And he says, hell, I don't know. <laughs> That's Gary LaFontaine. He has so many fly patterns, he doesn't know how to tell us how to tie them. We did get it all tied. All his flies are on video. And one of the things that I'm really tickled to death with, when we finished, Gary said, these flies are my legacy. And I'm just tickled to have a part in that. Thank you. I was 
acquainted with Gary when he first got started in Montana. The book, The Challenge of the Trout, was dedicated to Dick Fryover, who's my best friend. And I... My name's Chuck Stranahan. My acquaintance with Gary, like Mike and Jax, goes back to a sports show. I was in Los Angeles. I was on program there in the Fly Tying Theater, and that's where I met Gary. He was also on program. He had written a couple of books by then. That morning, get over to the gym up above the Crossroads Mall. They had a uh, place up above there that was a gymnasium. That he wanted to get there and practice. And it was apparent that Gary did lack basketball coordinating talents. <laughs> but his way of warming up was to play what I had traditionally known as a game of horse. But Gary had some variations of rules, and they varied as the game went on. And he called the games Caddis. Mayfly, and when he was far behind in the Caddis game, it became the Caddis Fly but game. I, I did have to say something to Jack that Gary did tell me in the last month that when he came back, he wanted to come, if he comes back, he wants to come back as a basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, true story. He, he's trying to make up <laughs> yeah. he but, tried to be the best. That's exactly right. And we sat there for hours on end. With talking about stories, and they, and and there were always stories about Mike and Jack, and uh, Stan, and I know things, guys. <laughs> 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 yeah, lots of things.